When I was 20 years old, my girlfriend was raped in New York City. In my anger and anguish over what happened to her, I went and confronted the man, and I took his life. The judge had sentenced me to 30 years in prison, of which I had to serve a minimum of 10 before I would be eligible for parole. I served 16 years in prison for my crime. None of us want to be defined only by the worst thing that we've ever done, but by who we are today and who we can be in the future. I believe the key to finding meaning and purpose is making a difference in the life of another person, paying it forward in the ways that you can, and really realizing that there's something greater than yourself that you need to be a part of. I'm John Valverde, CEO of Youth Build USA. I'm probably 22 years old at this point, and um, I just remember how hard it was the first two years. At this point, I wasn't sure that I was going to make it. Yeah. Really, I relied on visits from family to keep me connected to the outside, to remember uh, and remind me that there was a place that I could get to again that I could be free one day. I reconnected with my father early on, and he said to me, accept full responsibility for what you did, seek to make amends, and say yes as much as you can to help others, and you will find purpose and meaning and be free. And I really took that to heart and I looked for ways to be able to do that. I had gone to at least two years of college before my incarceration. In a world where the average reading and math levels are fifth grade, there was a lot of need, and I was able to say yes a lot. The gang members, the weapons dealer, the drug dealers, a lot of them would have trouble with reading and writing, and they would approach me and ask me to read letters from their family, even their children and they would ask me to help them respond. But one moment in particular involved a, a person my age where for the first time I saw someone that was just like me, looked like me, sounded like me, uh, but were it not for the circumstances I had experienced where I had actually gone to high school and even some college, I would be him. And it was connecting with this individual that made me realize I had not yet accepted full responsibility for what I had done. That was the part I needed to work on and that I wouldn't truly find meaning and purpose without transforming my remorse and my shame and my guilt into a redemptive journey. After tutoring and being a teacher's aide, I achieved my bachelor's and my master's degrees I also went on to take the LSAT. I was the first incarcerated person to do so, and the first incarcerated person to be accepted to law school. Each year, I set a goal to be better, so I have more tools to contribute to the world and to, to the lives of others. My greatest fear after surviving the first couple of years was that I would lose someone that I love that I'd be unable to be there for them uh, in the ways that I would want to. And I lost my father in an accident three years before my release. The day of my release, I was just happy to be leaving this place, but I was also terrified. I got into the car and got into the back seat and my mother looked back over her shoulder and she said, don't look back, only look forward. 
I was living with my mother in, in her basement. And within one week, I actually started working. I was working at a law firm. And I would answer the phone and I would be afraid to share my full name because they could look me up and find me on the internet. And I was so afraid of being exposed in that way. I started to realize that I was not living authentically. I was hiding from the world. I was home about nine months, almost 10 months at the time. And my sisters paid for this leadership training and it was in Midtown Manhattan. And the facilitator was going through an exercise called the fear exercise. And he explained that he was going to ask volunteers in the audience, there were 150 of us in the room, to answer the question, I am afraid of. And he went on to give an example of how powerful fear is. And the example he gave was related to incarceration. I immediately thought they had researched me and knew that I was in the room and had singled me out and I felt uh, in danger. And he went on to explain that they were asked to do some consulting work for a prison in Texas where the recidivism rate was 80%. Eight out of 10 individuals would return to incarceration after being released. And when they interviewed the individuals, over and over and over again, they heard the same answer. I'm more afraid to be in society where I will be judged, rejected, discriminated against, and even hated than I am being in prison where everyone is just like me and has done harm and done wrong and is living with their shame and their guilt. And I just no longer felt safe in that leadership seminar. The facilitator calls a break and I go out into uh, Midtown near Madison Square Garden and I call my sisters because I'm gonna tell them that I'm not going to continue with this seminar and what had happened to me. And, and in that moment, I realized that I had overcome so much in my life already, had survived 16 years in prison, and that I wasn't going to quit now. And I decided right there that I was going to go back in to the seminar and I was gonna raise my hand. And if I was one of the 10 people selected, I was going to address the room and share my story. So I went back into the room and I raised my hand and I was the 10th person selected. And people got up and they completed the sentence, I'm afraid of, with the words, my father, my boss, a failure. And then came my turn. So I completed the sentence, I'm afraid of, by saying, I'm afraid of all of you. That if you knew my background and my story, you would judge me, reject me, discriminate against me, and even hate me. And I went on to tell everyone there my story, about what had happened and what I had done, and all the hard work I had done to earn a second chance. And that that day, that moment, I had realized that I had put myself back in prison for those nine months by hiding away from the world, hoping no one would ever discover the truth about me. And it really was the beginning of my true freedom from incarceration as people began to see me for who I really am. And I began living into the authentic person that I am today. If you want things to change, sometimes or often, you have to change. And if you want things to get better, usually you have to get better. Shortly after, I resigned from the law firm and entered the nonprofit world where I believed I could be a voice and perhaps a face for second chances. And even in roles that I've had since then, I knew on those days where I didn't want to go into the office, that there was something I needed to reflect on, explore, that would reconnect me to my meaning and purpose. And I believe that I've found that here. 
One of the reasons I came to Youth Build was to be part of something greater than myself and be part of a team and a group of leaders and frankly be part of a movement that believed that young people have talent and gifts and intellect in equal measure but not equal access to opportunity to really create genuine second chances for people, we must see them as more than just their past or their zip code or their upbringing. We must see their potential so that they can live into futures they never imagined were possible. The quality of any person's life is always attached to the way you see yourself. So I've learned over the years how important it is to have a vision for where you see yourself years down the road, because without that vision, it will be impossible for you to live into it. But with it, you will develop the habits, practices, skills, create the priorities and goals that you need to get there. Take time to think and reflect uh, whether it's at the end of the year or the beginning of a new year where you're setting goals, to be sure that you're living the life that will be the most fulfilling for you, the kind of life that you can look back on and have as few or as little regrets as possible, knowing that you did your best. Without that support from my family and mentors and others, I wouldn't have made it. And what I would love to tell my 20-year-old self is to turn to others. Don't isolate yourself or hold things in. Have the courage to be vulnerable and share what you're struggling with and that if you open up, people will, will be there for you. I think if I had turned to others, even my own family, I would not have committed my crime and done harm in that way. So I would be grateful for the opportunity to be able to go back and tell my 20-year-old self to have faith in people and see the good in them.